and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. And if there's a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. Fourth, in terms of the speaking order, we will be beginning with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. Uh, finally, the House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. Good morning to our panel. I'm pleased to welcome Acting Chief of the Capitol Police, Yogananda Pittman, and Acting House Sergeant at Arms, Tim Blodgett. Today is our third of three hearings reviewing the aftermath of the breaching of the Capitol, Capitol by an insurrectionist mob on January 6th. The purpose of this hearing is to dig deeper into the failures that occurred on January 6th. I and the members of this subcommittee will be asking some very uncomfortable questions as we conduct a thorough review of what went wrong. I wanna emphasize at the outset that the hearing is not a gotcha exercise. None of us of what went wrong. I wanna emphasize at the outset that the hearing is not a gotcha exercise. None of us at this hearing can forget the events of January 6th, but how we respond will determine how we collectively learn from the trials of that day. Not as Democrats and Republicans, but as Americans charged with the responsibility of being caretakers of our Republic. As we move forward, we do not want to fall into the trap of preparing to fight the last war. We must be prepared to ensure the next one never happens. And if we ignore the mistakes of the past, the Capitol campus will continue to be vulnerable to unknown and unexpected threats. So I am going to start with a meeting I had on January 5th. I was briefed by then House Sergeant at Arms, Paul Irving, and U.S. Capitol Police Chief Sun. During the briefing, both Chief Sun and Mr. Irving provided assurances that the Capitol complex had comprehensive security and there was no active intelligence that groups would become violent at the Capitol during the certification of the electoral votes. I was later told by Chief Sun that his department did not have intelligence, that there would be an armed insurrection. Although we now know that there was in fact an intelligence report from his own department released on the third, which states, quote, unlike previous post-election protests, the targets of the pro-Trump supporters are not necessarily the counter protesters as they were previously, but rather Congress itself is the target on the 6th. As outlined above, there has been a worrisome call for protesters to come to these events armed, and there is the possibility that protesters may be inclined to become violent. This combined with Stop the Steel's propensity to attract white supremacists, militia members, and others who actively promote violence may lead to a significantly dangerous situation for law enforcement and the general public alike, end quote. But even putting the Capitol Police intelligence assessment aside, how could the security planning policies and procedures apparently be so lacking and ill-prepared? This event was widely promoted on social media weeks in advance, and your own report specifically shows the department was monitoring these posts. There were numerous groups with a history of violence known to be planning to attend, and these groups were actively discussing their plans on social media. I, for one, am at a loss to understand how your intelligence report, and then later as the mob walked 16 blocks, growing in size 
and aggressive demeanor failed to impact the Capitol Police Force security posture. I also would like the panel to address the failures regarding command and control and communication. I have spoken to many officers who felt that on that day of the attack, they were left alone and unsure how to respond. How did command and control break down so quickly? What needs to be changed? It has been widely reported that senior leadership was not reachable, nor providing direction to the officers. Is that true? We have also been told that there was not a clear understanding of the rules of engagement and the level of force that officers were expected to use as the attack unfolded. How could that have happened? Once the Capitol was breached, was there a strategic plan to secure the building? Now I look forward, I hope you can provide updates to the committee as to how the Capitol Police and Sergeant at Arms are currently protecting the campus and its workforce and to talk about the next steps to ensure the future physical safety of our campus. We need to know what you think are the major institutional and cultural reforms and or overhauls needed to maintain as safe and as open a campus as possible so that the visitors from across the country and around the world can witness representative democracy in action. I look forward to your answers to these questions and more. I want you to know that we are very thankful for your service and that of the staff of your organizations who work so hard to make this house run. At this point, I would like to yield to my friend and colleague, the ranking member, Jamie Herrera Butler for an opening statement that you would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Acting Chief Pittman and Acting Sergeant at Arms Blodgett for being here today. Uh, January 6th, the whole world watched in disbelief as the center of American democracy was assaulted. The very ideals of democracy that make us the envy of the world were attacked. It was the Constitution in action. It was the counting of the electoral votes. It was the transfer of power um, that takes place every four years. Uh, and it was literally under uh, insurrection. The very ideals um, uh, were coming under fire. And that day, an angry mob with the intention to destroy not just the symbols of our freedom, but the people who took an oath to serve and protect the Constitution. The assault on the Capitol will forever be a painful reminder that democracy and the rule of law are not guaranteed to us. We must continuously fight to uphold them. With that in mind, we have to take very seriously that it's our job as both the American people and as members of Congress to make sure this never happens again. This starts with a clear and candid assessment of what went wrong. Um, here's the truth. Top officials either failed to take seriously the intelligence received or the intelligence failed to reach the right people. This meant that the Capitol Police Force was woefully unprepared for the attack. To be clear, the United States Capitol Police Force is not meant to be an army. Expecting 1,600 officers to hold back an unruly mob of eight to 10,000 people, many of whom were armed and had their own homemade uh, explosive devices or had came, came with or weaponized um, everyday items, it's not a position we should ever have to be in. But understand, uh, what fa but we must understand what failed on that day, whether it was a broken lines of communication, whether it was inadequate training, um, uh, not enough for the correct equipment, decision-making processes, or everything in between. Look, security is essential, and we all have a fundamental need to feel safe on the Capitol grounds. It's up to the Capitol Police and the Sergeant at Arms to provide that assurance so that we may work on behalf of the American people without um, obstruction or fear of violence. While we absolutely must do better to keep this place secure, I have to say it's also important that we try to keep this institution as accessible to the public as possible. We are the people's house. 
Sacrificing the openness of this institution is not the only way to keep the Capitol secure. I don't like that there's a fence around the Capitol complex that makes the seat of democracy look like a military base. And I don't like that it costs almost $2 million a week. Um, I hope we're able to find ways to secure this place without such measures. A balance, I believe, must be and can be struck. Um, I look forward to working with the legislative branch, with Chairman Ryan, and with the different agencies involved to figure out what that balance is and to execute it as quickly and efficiently as possible. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mr. Butler. Appreciate your leadership on all this and uh, appreciate how you've conducted this in a bipartisan manner. Uh, it's been a, a joy to work with you. Um, next, we will ask the, the chair of the full appropriations committee, Congresswoman Rosa DeLora, uh, for any opening statements that she would like to make. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Herrera Butler, and a welcome to our witnesses. Uh, I am so grateful to join with you uh, <coughs> as we dig deeper into the security failures that occurred on January 6th. On that day, our nation held its collective breath, watching in disbelief as violent insurrectionists rioted in our capital. We listened in horror as insurrectionists were spurred on. As the mob stormed the Capitol building, aiming to disrupt Congress, and yes, they came for the Congress. Members of the U.S. Capitol Police and the House Sergeant at Arms valiantly leapt into the fray, but they were overwhelmed. These courageous women and men risked their lives to defend our democracy. It's a testament to their bravery and their dedication, that no members or staff were physically harmed. But it breaks all of our hearts that so many Capitol Police officers were injured in the attack, many quite severely. We pray for the officers and their families as they have dealt with the unfolding tragedy of that day, especially the family of Officer Brian Sicknick. And our hearts are heavy for the loss of Capitol Police Officer Howard Liebengood, who died by suicide in January. As we honor these sacrifices, we must take the hard look at just what exactly happened on that dark day and what we need to do to ensure such an alarming breach, such an alarming failure of our capital security. This should never happen again. The attack exposed weaknesses in our capital security systems that are far greater than any of us would have ever anticipated. And it has made it abundantly clear that the Capitol Police and the Sergeant of Arms require major institutional and cultural reforms. What went wrong on January 6th? As the committee that funds the security of the Capitol, today we hope we can gain a better understanding of the problems that the Capitol Police and the Sergeant at Arms must address, what resources they need to reform themselves, to keep members, congressional staff, employees, and their own officers safe. What are the solutions? What should the role of the Capitol Police Board be? I say a thank you to our witnesses for joining us today. Acting Chief of Police Yogananda Pittman briefed members of the Appropriations Committee last month, and I hope we can continue to drill down on the issues that we discussed then. And Acting House Sergeant at Arms Tim Blodgett brings an important perspective from this from his office. On January 6, 2021, our nation gazed into the abyss. Our democracy indeed is fragile. But the security of our seat of government should never be. And that is why it is so immensely important that we have an open and honest discussion to ensure the events like those do not take place, that took place on January 6th, can ever happen again. And I yield back and thank the gentleman. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman uh, DeLauro. Uh, next is ranking member of the full Appropriations Committee, Kay Granger, for any opening statements uh, you'd like to make, Kay. I'd like to thank Chairman Ryan and, and uh, ranking member Jamie Herrera Butler for holding this important hearing today. The January 6th attack on the Capitol was something I never thought I would witness. In the face of great danger, U.S. Capitol Police bravely fought to defend the complex and ensure our members and staff were safe. In addition to making sure that the Capitol Police have the support and resources they need to process and heal from the traumatic events of that day, we must ensure that they have the resources necessary to defend the Capitol against similar attacks. 
it was clear from our briefing last month that the failure to protect the capital was not due to a lack of intelligence, but rather a failure to properly act on the intelligence. There was also a clear lack of command and control because so many agencies were involved, yet their actions were not coordinated. This is unacceptable and left our law enforcement men and women on the ground unprepared for the very real threat they face. At the center of this controversy is the Capitol Police Board, which includes the Sergeant at Arms, Architect of the Capitol, and Capitol Police. Serious questions remain about their failure to approve the request from the Capitol Police Chief to call in the National Guard and properly notify members and staff on the status of the threat through the emergency notification system. As we speak, miles of fencing still surrounds the Capitol and the center of American government is now tarnished by razor wire and limited access. While we must take, we must take the necessary steps to make the Capitol complex safe and secure, we must have the ultimate goal of safely reopening the Capitol and its ground to the public. The Capitol and its buildings belong to the American people, not us. They need to be able to visit their elected representatives and know they will be safe while doing so. I want the witnesses to discuss what changes have been made and will need to continue to be made to ensure the Capitol complex is protected. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Granger. We're now going to move to our witnesses. Uh, without objection, uh, your written testimonies will be made part of the record. We ask you to please summarize your statement and highlight your efforts to the committee. Chief Pittman, please begin. And after your statement, we'll turn to uh, Sergeant at Arms Blodgett for his statement. Once the statements are complete, we will move to the question and answer session. So please begin, uh, Chief Pittman. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee. On January 6th, our strength, determination, and commitment to the mission of protecting the democratic process was tested. Fortunately, the USCP succeeded in its mission. With the assistance of law enforcement partners like MPD, the United States Capitol Police protected the congressional leadership members, and the democratic process. On January 6, I was the assistant chief of police of the department's protective and intelligence operations. Leading up to January 6, the department gathered information about the anticipated events of the day and released assessments that analyzed the raw information received from multiple sources. The department issued four assessments about the January 6th event. The final assessment indicated, amongst other things, that militia groups, white supremacists, and other extremist groups would be participating in the January 6th event. These groups planned to be armed, the target of the demonstration would be Congress, and the demonstrators saw this as a last opportunity to overturn the results of the presidential election and they were desperate. The assessment was widely shared throughout the department, and in response to the assessment, the department made significant changes to its security posture. We increased the size of protection details, deployed counter surveillance agents across DC, increased our CDU platoons, including deploying hard platoons. We deployed SWAT teams, enlarged the security perimeter, and increase exterior and interior patrols to include the subways. Since the 6th, it has been suggested that the department was either ignorant of or ignored critical intelligence that indicated that an attack of the magnitude that we experienced on January 6th would occur. The department was not ignorant of intelligence indicating an attack of the size and scale we encountered on the 6th. There was no such intelligence. Although we knew the likelihood for violence by extremists, no credible threat indicated that tens of thousands 
would attack the U.S. Capitol, nor did the intelligence received from the FBI or any other law enforcement partner indicate such a threat. Indeed, the Secret Service brought the Vice President to the Capitol that day as they were also unaware of any credible threat of that magnitude. The Department also did not ignore intelligence that we had which indicated an elevated risk of violence from extremist groups. To the contrary, we heightened our security posture. There is evidence that some of those who stormed the Capitol were organized, but there's also evidence that a large number were everyday Americans who took on a mob mentality because they were angry and desperate. It is the conduct of this latter group that the department was not prepared for. The department did face some operational challenges that we are addressing. For example, the Capitol lockdown was not properly executed. Some of the officers were unsure of when to use lethal force. Our radio communications to officers were not as robust. And we are ensuring that our incident command system protocols are adhered to going forward and re-implementing training in those respective areas. We are addressing those operational challenges, but I want to make clear that these measures alone would not have stopped the threat we faced. To stop a mob of tens of thousands requires more than a police force. It requires physical infrastructure or a regiment of soldiers. Since the six, we have hardened the complex and we know that some of those temporary enhancements are not popular, but these are necessary in the short term. The department is beefing up its flow of information and now holds daily calls with its intelligence partners. I would like to thank the committee for their continued support and ensuring the department has what it needs. I'd also like to thank the chairman for helping the department to ensure that our officers have the mental wellness resources that they and their families need. As to the USCP officers that proudly serve the congressional community, they fought bravely on January 6. They are heroes. I am ready to answer your questions. Thank you. Chair, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Granger, Chairman Ryan, Ranking Member Herrera-Butler, and the members of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Ledge Branch. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the security failures of January 6th. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge the debt of gratitude we owe to the officers of the United States Capitol Police, Metropolitan Police, and the law enforcement partners who came to the aid of the institution and risked their lives so that our Constitution and democracy could endure. I cannot thank them enough. I want to thank Congress for helping provide a fitting tribute to Officer Sicknick. We mourn as a community for the loss of his life, but the recognition rightfully bestowed upon him hopefully served as a moment of healing for the Capitol Police and for all law enforcement who make sacrifices on a daily basis to provide for our safety. And I want to acknowledge the sacrifices of Officer Liebengood and Smith and their families. Their sacrifices will never be forgotten. And I finally want to thank the National Guard who have come from near and far to keep our city on the hill safe. They have left their families amidst a pandemic to work in an uncertain environment and their presence makes us safer. As I stated in my previous briefing to the Appropriations Committee, the intelligence surrounding January 6th was problematic. Intelligence requires finding needles in a haystack. On January 6th, there was a failure to either gather, synthesize, or disseminate intelligence, and there were indications that the intelligence was muddled or contradictory. For example, the January 3rd intelligence assessment from the Capitol Police has been touted to include information that makes it clear that January 6th would become violent. However, the document also states that the protesters' rallies are expected to be similar to the previous Million MAGA March rallies in November and December of 2020, which drew tens of thousands of individuals. As we know now, the events of January 6th were not like the previous marches or any other rallies that we've had on Capitol grounds. The intelligence provided to the Capitol Police and other law enforcement did not anticipate a coordinated attack. Warnings should not be qualified or hidden. Bad information, conflicting information, 
or missing information leads to poor decisions. In fact, when the Capitol Police presented this assessment to the sergeant at arms, they simultaneously briefed on the plan of action for January 6th. And one would think that the plan was developed, taking into account the intelligence that they were seeing at the time. One would also expect the warnings to be reflected in all subsequent intelligence reports. The Office of the Sergeant at Arms received daily intelligence reports from the Capitol Police following the initial assessments referenced on the 3rd. On January 4th, 5th, and 6th, the Capitol Police listed demonstrations and categorized the probability of civil disobedience or arrests as remote, highly improbable, or improbable for each of those days and for every single demonstration. The characterization of the threat posed by these protests only reinforced the notion and thinking that they were similar to the two previous demonstrations and not the violent insurrection that we experienced. The Office of the Sergeant at Arms is a consumer of intelligence products. We do not independently acquire or analyze intelligence. We are dependent on the Capitol Police and the intelligence communities to provide timely, accurate, and succinct intelligence to help guide our decisions. And it pains me to say, but the intelligence missteps cascaded into inadequate preparation, which placed the health and lives of frontline officers at risk. While frontline officers did everything they could that day, the Capitol Police was prepared for a First Amendment event, but not adequately prepared for the events of January 6th. For example, former Chief Sun noted in his letter to congressional leadership that he had expedited the delivery of approximately 104 helmets to officers. It was a good decision to expedite the delivery of the helmets, but it also raises questions as to why the officers did not have the helmets on hand. I support any efforts we can to acquire all gear for our officers to keep them safe and to be able to keep the gear on hand and express the support to the Capitol Police Board. Proper planning before an event will provide the needed support to the officers on the line and help ensure that the event does not turn into a crisis. We must also prepare for contingencies. The failure to prepare for contingencies can result in greater difficulty in execution. Security examinations are currently underway to make sure that we are prepared for the next January 6th. Lieutenant General Honore and his task force have been working to not only examine the security postures on the Hill, but also the security of members traveling as well as in their districts. My office has worked in coordination with General Honore and his team to support this critical tasking. This could prove to be valuable input in how we better align the Office of the Sergeant at Arms to provide security services to members. In the aftermath of January 6th, I know the Office of the Sergeant at Arms must provide more to members and staff to keep them safe. These better services will come with an accompanying cost. I am committed to carefully stewarding the funds that the subcommittee provides. Funding is an important aspect, but just as important, if not more so, is the right organizational structure. A new look and perspective will help inform my own proposals the subcommittee will see. I also support necessary infrastructure improvements, support the changes that the Capitol Police will propose to its FTE structures, equipment upgrades, and more importantly, the investment in its officers. The Capitol Police and the Office of the Sergeant at Arms will evolve to better secure Congress. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Chief Pittman. Chief Pittman, let me start with you. First, let me say thank you to you for the lines of communication have improved dramatically over the past weeks, and I want to just say thank you to you and your team, Chief Pittman, for making sure you're staying in contact with the committee in the Congress. I've got a couple questions. So you were talking about increasing the size of the dignitary protection, posting dignitary protection agents, extending coverage of the investigations division. So when you said you increased the size of dignitary protection, how many people were increased there? How many law enforcement people were increased? Yes, sir. Thank you. So we went from four-man protection details and increased that to six-man protection details. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's not a significant increase at all when you're talking about, you know, what we went through. How about some of the other things you mentioned? So you embedded an analyst, deploying counter-surveillance agents. So how many counter-surveillance agents did you 
uh, deploy in the morning of the 6th. So we deployed all of our counter surveillance agents that we have available to us. We also increased our uh, open source operations, if you will, to go from uh, a 16 hour day to we uh, separated our manpower to ensure that we had open source uh, operations around the clock. So all of our uh, PSB operators, if you will, which includes dignitary protection, the investigations division, as well as intelligence, were operating on a 24 seven platform. Now, I, I understand that, and the, my, my main point is that this was not in any way a significant increase in the amount of law enforcement that were out there moving in detail from four to six. Uh, even if you did that multiple times, is not any significant increase. And I guess the question I have is that if if you felt like and everybody felt like this was adequate, why was Chief Sun trying to press the sergeant at arms for more help? So let me just uh, be clear. As it relates to dignitary protection, that is just a small portion of U.S. Capitol Police. So there's a limited number of dignitary protection agents that are specially trained in that area. So increasing from a four-person team to a six-person team essentially is all of the dignitary protection agents that U.S. Capitol Police has available to them. So there was... I'm so going from from that four person team to six is every person that we have as it relates to the operational side of the house. That's where the the uh, bulk of the agency is employed by the Uniform Services Bureau. So that's where the increase uh, came primarily from as it relates to forming up those civil disturbance units. So prior to that January 3rd assessment, uh, the operational plan required for four platoons to be activated on for the January 6th event. Uniform operations increased that platoon size to maximize its strength to seven platoons. That is essentially every available officer that we have to form up our CDU units. That's 276 officers approximately with 40 person uh, platoons each. Four of those platoons, I, excuse me, three of those platoons comprise of hard platoons. Those are the officers that you see in the hard turtle gear and they have extra, if you will, uh, less than lethal options available to them as well as tactical gear, sir. Okay, and I appreciate that, but my, my point is that clearly Chief Sun didn't think that was enough because he was going to the uh, uh, Sergeant at Arms, Mr. Irving, and saying, hey, we need more help. Uh, and so he knew. Did you, did you feel that same way? Yes, sir. So I have an accurate account of the request that Chief Sun made. Uh, to lean forward as it relates to the National Guard, and I think that's what you're referring to. Uh, my team since January 6th um, actively pulled all of the cell phone records from Chief Sun, and they show the following. On January 6th, Chief Sun first reached out for National Guard support to the House Sergeant at Arms at 12.58 p.m., he then spoke to the Senate Sergeant at Arms to make the same request for the National Guard at 1.05 p.m. And he repeated his request to the House Sergeant at Arms at 1.28 p.m., speaking again with them at 1.34, 1.39, and 1.45. Chief Sun spoke to both Sergeant at Arms to request National Guard support. Now, Chief, Chief. I don't mean to yes, interrupt, sir. but mm -hmm. we're limited on time here a little bit. Yes, sir. I'm, ta I'm talking about prior to January 6th. My main point here is that we, we appreciate that you increased dignitary protection and the platoons and all the rest. That's still a limited number. I think it's important that the committee and the Congress knows that yes. that's a, limited, a very limited number compared to what the threat was and what we think the threat assessment is. And my question to you is, Chief Sun clearly – was worried and he called Mr. Irving prior to the 6th. 
Yes, sir. And said, hey, we need more help. Mr. Irving said, no, go ask the National Guard to lean in. And quite frankly, I don't even know what lean in means. If that's some kind of term that I, I don't know, but uh, what does lean in mean? It means, you know, shut up and, and don't ask me for any more help is what, how I take that. And my question is, and, and we've got a lot of questions here, but my question is, were you in agreement with, because you're now the acting chief and part of this enterprise here that we're into is about moving forward. At that time, were you in agreement with Chief Sun that you needed more support from primarily from the National Guard? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, my time is up, uh, Ms. Herrera, and, and I just want the committee to know, uh, like yesterday, um, we are, we're going to take a little bit of liberties with the time to make sure that these questions get answered. Uh, we have a smaller committee that allows us to maybe do some of that. So um, with that, I'm going to yield to Ms. Herrera Butler. Uh, our sergeant, acting sergeant at arms, uh, Blodgett, if we could, and then maybe scale back. Um, you know, uh, when when I when I talk about communications failures, um, I'm not necessarily talking about like the tweets and the texts that came to members while this was happening. What you and I discussed on the phone, and what I think is really important is, is I was standing next to officers, both uh, sergeant of arms uh, and um, capital police officers. As the insurrection was happening on the House floor, getting to the House floor, um, it was very clear that their headpieces, like the, the communications pieces, they were getting no actual real communication. They were getting no leadership. They were getting no direction. They had, they, there was no coordination. And you could see the fear in their eyes. Like they literally, they're, the brave men and women who were just kind of left out on their own to defend did the best they could with what they had. Um, you know, there's a there's a video on YouTube where the the woman who was was shot. There's a time, you know, with different uh, armed forces and different forces coming in at from different angles, and it was very clear that the person who who shot didn't know that there was a tactical team coming up the stairs, and they all have earpieces in. So clearly, when so when I talk about communications failures, I'm literally talking about the leadership, no one owning the frequency and giving direction. And that's the thing I want to know. I want to know if you're fixing that. I mean, I, I'm, I, it's great that you guys send out text messages when there's like, you know, closures and things, and that's helpful. But the big communications failure on my, in my, from my vantage point, and what I've, when I've talked to other members is, um, I've talked to uh, Representative Mark Wayne Willen, who was on the floor helping barricade the door with those officers who had their firearms drawn. And he said he could hear the shouting and the chaos in the earpieces of the officers who were trying to do the defense. So they were on their own. Are you fixing that? And please be brief because I have a couple more questions. Acting Sergeant of Arms, are you there? Apologize. I was on mute. I have to remember to unmute. Um, Yes, that's something we need to fix, and we need, need to fix it immediately. I believe the chief acknowledged in her, in her statement, and I, I don't want to speak for the acting chief, but that uh, communication needs to be uh, enhanced. Uh, it drives either out of the command center or the incident command post, uh, where wherever that is set up, um, in terms of that. Um, in terms of the communication Sorry. with my staff, Okay. Um, in Sergeant Arms, we don't control the Capitol Police uh, radios. While we, we have the radios and can hear uh, what is or is not going on, uh, we do not interject during, during a crisis. Um, we communicate with our staff uh, via the cell phone, text message, um, and we were in close contact. The situation where you discussed where uh, Officer Bird was at the door, uh, when Ms. Babbitt was shot, it was, it was our uh, Sergeant Arms employee who rendered the aid uh, to her at that site. Can I, can I jump in there? So, sure. so you guys are in charge, though, of the security on the House floor, or are you just there to make sure that we take our coats off when we're on camera? Uh, we, are, we are there um, to enforce the rules of the House, um, to work in conjunction with the Capitol Police to, to make sure that it's safe. Um, we had staff on the floor and in the galleries uh, as well. 
So can I ask, um, so talking about what happened on the floor, when the Senate was evacuated, and maybe this will be a, 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 a Chief Pittman question, um, when the Senate was evacuated, it was several minutes, and I don't have the timeline in front of me, before the House was evacuated. Why, 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 did, why were we locked in and left on the House floor um, when there were known assailants in the building and the Senate was being evacuated? Did we not have a plan for evacuation? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, we, yes, we had the Office of Sergeant Arms put together a plan for evacuating the House floor. Um, the tactical decision to evacuate um, would be left to the Capitol Police because at the command center, they can see what's going on uh, throughout uh, the campus. We don't have eyes on that. Okay, let me switch off to Chief Pittman. Chief Pittman, um, can you speak to the lack of communication to your officers on their radios? And can you also speak to the reason that there was a, a, de a decent time delay between when um, the Senate was evacuated and the House was evacuated? Yes, ma'am. So as it relates to communications, uh, U.S. Capitol Police has practiced um, routine drills, if you will, for the incident command system since uh, the September 11th incident. On January 6th, our incident command protocols were not adhered to as they should have. Basically, right. within, yeah, let's tell me. Specific. A, yes, ma'am. Within an incident command structure, you have operational uh, uh, operational order, if you will, and it designates who is in charge of what uh, from your incident person, incident command structure on the ground, as well as a lot of your leadership folks, to include myself and several other the other deputy chiefs, are posted within the command center. So you actually have a thousand foot view, if you will, and then a boots on the ground view. Those boots on the ground view, uh, the persons in charge of our civil disturbance unit, as well as those operational commanders that are in charge of the Capitol, are responsible for that implementing, implementation of that incident command system. So when there's a, a breakdown, you, you look for those commanders with boots on the ground to provide that instruction. Uh, that did not happen primarily because those uh, operational commanders at the time were so overwhelmed, they started to participate and assist the officers with boots on the ground versus providing that uh, guidance and direction, if you will. Can I ask, so were, are you talking about the officers who were, when you say boots on the ground, the guys who are in gals who are literally defending us against the attackers, are you saying they were responsible for the communications breakdown amongst themselves? No, so, ma'am. So I want to know why yourself and the other leaders did not maintain or regain control of the comm system because you had a bird's eye view advantage. Yes. So the expectation is uh, not that those officers would be in charge of the communication. Those commanders would be in charge of, that were directly responsible that those officers reported to because they have the tactical advantage and strategic lens, if you will, on with those officers. Are on you the saying team. those commanders then somehow, and I, this is an honest question, so the commanders yes, failed to regain control of the comm systems and direct the officers who were on the front lines? I think it's a multi-tiered uh, failure, if you will. Can I, that, can I really yes. quickly just read, this is something I think is really important. The Capitol Police Union issued an overwhelming no confidence vote for the force's top leaders including Acting Chief Yogananda Pittman, yourself, and half a dozen other agency leaders. Pittman drew a 92% no confidence vote with 657 of the 1050 union members participating in the vote. The vote is symbolic, obviously it's not actionable, but of note, roughly half of the US Capitol Police sworn officers belong to the union. So I, I am frustrated that what I'm not hearing is uh, you know, hey, I was sitting there watching this with a bird's eye view and I tried to like some I'm not here. I'm hearing a lot of process and a lot of like almost 
explaining why there's a problem versus hearing how you're going to make sure that there is a command center who speaks into the earpieces of the officers and provides direction and leadership. That part of the problem there was chaos was because each and, of, each and every one of these officers, boots on the ground, commander or not, had to make a decision with no information. Like there was no incoming help as far as they knew. They had no idea what you guys were doing. I mean, I my hat is off to these brave men and women. They saved our lives. And I'm frustrated that I'm not hearing, this is how we're fixing that right now. This is what we're doing. And that's what I expect. And I know, Mr. Chairman, my time is is up. I'll I'll wait for a next round. So you'll back. Yeah, that, thank, thank you, Ms. Rare Butler. Uh, just quickly as a, as a quick follow-up before we go to Ms. Deloro, um, in, in line with what Ms. Rare Butler was just saying, um, can you give us an explanation like about the preparation for January 6th and was there any, any special training for the officers to have them prepared for this? Yes, sir. So a couple points of uh, clarification. Uh, explaining the incident command structure uh, was just re uh, basically to detail what the system was supposed to do. Uh, the executive team here has taken a number of proactive steps to ensure that incident command protocols are adhered to in the future as it relates to the command staff that are giving directions in the command center. Uh, that was forthcoming. I myself directed the Capitol lockdown on the day in question. With that said, there are many more uh, improvements to be made. Uh, as it relates to the vote of no confidence, uh, the numbers there are not uh, t totally accurate. 36% uh, of our sworn population, less than half of uh, the uh, available officers that could have voted said that they vote a uh, no confidence for the Capitol Police leadership. With that being said, I think that one vote is one vote too many. February 11th, on the day of that vote, marked one month and three days since I was sworn in as the acting chief. Uh, since then, my team and I have been working around the clock, and the, the entire department has been working around the clock, and I think that we've made some very important changes as well as improvements. We're working on the communications to improve that. We've streamlined a number of items to include the joint emergency notification messaging system. We've streamlined communications between U.S. Capitol Police and our law enforcement partners. We've also streamlined communications between the upper management and how that information is delivered to the rank and file. In addition to that, we've increased uh, our wellness resources and, and the delivery of vaccines to all of our employees. Obviously, with that vote, we acknowledge that there's more work to be done. I know that because I talked to the officers. I've been here for 20 years and I've grown up in this agency. Many of those officers are not just my colleagues. Those are my friends and their personal well-being is personal to me. As it relates to CDU training, all of our officers that are coming out of the training academy receive 40 hours of training as it relates to CDU. In addition to that, our officers that have specialized training, what we refer to as the hard gear or turtle gear, receive an additional uh, 20 seven hours of training or 24 hours of training for them to be trained on special equipment. So to answer your question, Mr. Chairman, there absolutely is additional training for those hard platoon uh, CDU officers. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll, we're, we're going to come back to that. But there wasn't any special training specifically about January 6th, uh, to, to have them prepared for that. You're, you're talking about the standard training that they get, not in particular for this this moment in time with all of the intelligence and everything else that we had. There was no- That, that specialized training carries over with those officers. Those officers train on a routine basis as it relates to hard gear uh, platoons that they are prepared for civil disturbance riots. Mm -hmm. So those officers are trained specially for those types of events. Yes, sir. Ms. Delora. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd like to direct my attention here, if you will, to the um, the role, the function, um, the relevance of the Capitol Police Board. Um, can you either both, well, both of you, what does the Capitol Police Board do? What is its mission? What is its authority? Thank, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Somebody? Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the Capitol Police Board acts as a, uh, a policy uh, kind of board of directors over the Capitol Police. Uh, there's some statutory authorities that they do have uh, with vehicle and traffic, uh, and the Capitol Police enforce those on a day-to-day basis. Um, there's obviously the emergency uh, and request for executive branch assistance, uh, protection of leadership overseas, um, and, de- and deployments are just some of the, some of the uh, direct statutory uh, inputs that the Capitol Police Board does have. Um, I, I see the role of the Capitol Police Board is to provide the policy guidance to the chief, support the chief and the needs that she, she has to both your, com- your committees um, and then obviously on the Senate as well. Um, and then to take your concerns uh, with the police and work with the Capitol Police to uh, correct those concerns that you have, as well as personally providing a House perspective to um to the policing of the grounds. Uh, uh, and, and, and Chief, what, what is your of the role of the Capitol Police Board? I'm sorry, ma'am, you were breaking up. Could you repeat your question? Oh, sure. Your, your, your view of the role of the Capitol Police Board. Yes, so the Capitol Police Board, in my view, provides direct oversight uh, to the United States Capitol Police. When there are huge or special events that are occurring on the campus, the United States Capitol Police uh, develops an operational uh, plan and they share those plans with the Capitol Police Board uh, as it relates to uh, an intelligence perspective on any types of events. The Capitol Police Board is kept apprised of any of those things as well. But they, the Capitol Police Board works in close uh, collaboration with, if you will, with the members of Congress so that they can make their security needs known. And then that information is kind of like a, a two-way communication. The Capitol uh, Police Board would then share those requirements with the Capitol Police as it relates to security. With, with regard to January 6th, Was the Capitol Police Board functioning? Did it function? What operational plans were being reviewed? Is it not the fact that when the request for National Guard, uh, when there was a request for National Guard, the Capitol Police, uh, the board uh, said that um, uh, the optics wouldn't be good or we don't need this or the request D- 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 denied. Uh, you, you, there it doesn't appear to be. What what is its what is its real role? Is it have a a, a role in oversight of the of of, of the Capitol Police? Um, uh, I know it does a lot of ceremonial things, and I appreciate that everybody has to be taken care of, but. This board and its, um, where was the board and how did it function prior to January 6th and on January 6th? So, ma'am, if I could answer that question as it relates to Capitol Police uh, prior to January 6th, I think it's important to note that by statute, in order for U.S. Capitol Police to have the National Guards on its grounds in a law enforcement capacity, the Capitol Police Board must first declare an emergency. So in order for us 
I think you know, Capitol yeah. Police, your responsibility was to declare an emergency before the Capitol Police Board could respond. No? Okay. Help no, me. No, ma'am. So by statute, in order for the U.S. Capitol Police to have the National Guards on our grounds, the Capitol Police Board must declare Board an emergency. To- yes, ma'am. Was there a- any emergency declared? either prior to with intelligence information that determined that um, uh, we they were coming for the Congress um, and in, in, in and quite frankly in the midst what where were they where was this board prior to and during this uh, insurrection yes ma'am so it is my understanding that Chief Sun did make the request to right. the Capitol Police Board to declare an emergency. When? So that when? When? Prior, prior to January 6th. Prior to January 6th. Yes. And the response from the Capitol Police Board was that his request it, was denied. Know. Right. And the other, the issue was, and I don't have uh, uh, all of my uh, uh, quotes in front of me here, but that it was the optics of the National Guard being on the, the, the that was a concern. Well, ma'am, I, don't have, I did, was not privy firsthand to those conversations okay. Okay. to okay. say whether or not they said optics. Okay. So, but I know the request was denied. The request was denied. The request made prior to January 6th, that we have National Guard on the premise, and that request was denied by this board. And and it would appear that this board has... I, 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 I can't get a delineation, and we'll find it, of where its authority begins, where it derives from, what it is, and... Does it does rule by, by fiat? They make a decision, and it and it and, and it and it occurs. Mr. Blodgett, ma'am, ma'am, I, I believe that, you're on the board. Yes, I'm currently on the board. Yes, I was not on the board on January sixth. However, my understanding um, is it was brought up uh, at the December board meeting. Um, I would have to go back and check that Chief Sun uh, brought up uh, the National Guard to Mr. Irving um, on the 4th. Mr. Irving, I believe, testified uh, the other day that he did not take that to be an ask for an emergency declaration. Um, Talked to Mr. Stanger. Um, they, uh, I do not believe that the chief ever spoke to the architect of the, of the Capitol uh, prior to that, I believe that's what Mr. Blanton uh, testified to yesterday, um, who is also on the board. Uh, so the ask would have to come from from all three. Um, the uh, Capitol Police Board issued a verbal declaration of emergency to give authority to National Guard employment on 210 on the 6th. So, uh, Rosa, Rosa. Correct. Rosa, if I Please, could just, go ahead. If I could just follow up this, here. This I, board seems to be obsolete. This yeah. board seems to be non-functioning. And, and I think we're, we're, we're getting to the point here. So uh, whether it's Tim or uh, Chief Pittman, it sounds that, uh, there was an official denial of the December meeting for the emergency order. No, no, no. I, I apologize. The... the, the uh, the demonstrations were discussed. There was no request at that time for an order. Did I there was there was no request for right. yesterday, and there was never a vote by the board. And I think this is what's really important about how to get to the bottom of this. So it sounds like Mr. Irving was taking all of the authority by the board should have had, and was basically denying Chief Sun's request without even bringing it to the board. So that brings about two questions that this may have, and I think a lot of us have, is that who the hell gave Mr. Irving the authority to not bring requests by the chief of the Capitol Police 
who wants more act, more help, Mr. Irving makes a decision, a unanimous decision, uh, all by himself, to deny that request and then to go say, go tell the National Guard to lean in. That's problem number one. And problem number two is why didn't Chief Sun push back and demand, I think this is a question for all of us, and demand that he brings that to the board for a vote. So now you bring in the architect of the Capitol, you maybe build an ally to help make this happen. So it sounds like, uh, Chair Delora, that, that the sergeant at arms took the liberties of making this decision without bringing it to the full board. Sir, if I, if I may, I, I... I don't think that Mr. I, I can't speak for Mr. Irving, but he did testify that he did not take that January 4th conversation uh, with Chief Sund is an ask for an emergency declaration. Um, but you've hit on a historical uh, tension on the board. Uh, there was a report in 2002 of GAO and a subsequent report to Congress by the board at that time in 2003, which talks about um, you know, emergencies and, and the board and, and how the structures need to be tightened and they need to be forward thinking. And I'm happy to provide the, that report to the committee um, as well. Um, but it sums up the tension and, and it talks about some of the issues that you, that you raised. Chair, Chairwoman Delora, do you have any further questions? No. is critical, whether it is needs to be revamped, what kind of authority does it have. At the moment, I view it as a vestigial, uh, 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 it's, it's just there. It doesn't appear to do a hell of a lot, nor did it do a hell of a lot to deal with this situation on January 6th. It's, it's like your appendix. It's just there. It doesn't have any real function. So the question is, um, uh, the photos of uh, footage of Capitol Police posing for photos with insurrectionists. There are on ongoing investigations is what my understanding is. How many officers are under investigation? What's the rationale? When will the, the investigation be concluded? When can we get in a, a report? Yes, ma'am. So right now we have 35 officers that are under investigation and we do have six uh, police officers that have been suspended with their police powers being revoked. So those uh, investigations are ongoing at this time. What what was the rationale? For, what's the rationale for the investigation? I mean, on what premise are you investigating them? Yes, ma'am. If there is an allegation of misconduct, Capitol Police has what's called a rules of conduct. And it's basically a code of conduct that governs our behavior as police officers. If there's a violation of that rules of conduct, uh, based on those violations, we make decisions to investigate those officers and uh, okay. proceed accordingly because the discipline is warranted. What, when, when is the investigation going to be concluded? When can we get a report? Investigation is going to be concluded when? The investigations are concluded based on typically a 60 to 90 day scale. No, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yes, ma'am. And as soon as we have okay. that information, we will report it out. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for okay. indulging uh, the time. I probably yep, of course. Going over. Stranger. Thank you. Uh, what I'm, what I'm seeing is, uh, what I was hoping to hear are important changes and lessons learned and where we go fr from here. What I'm hearing is the same old stuff and pointing fingers and it looks like protecting jobs. And having faced something as serious as we faced and know that this could happen again, this is very, very disappointing at the least and frightening at the most. Um, and it seems as if, particularly in the communication, in the days leading up to the 6th or whatever, then we have a system that failed at every level. And even at the time when we were seeing very, very serious, dangerous things happening and we were watching or participating in the case of members of Congress, 
um, I think that, that this has to be looked at and go back and have proof of the communication and then why in the world could action not be taken at that time when there was time to do something. I, I would also like having sat through uh, the uh, another um, meeting where we listened to testimony, I would like the, the testimony at the other proceedings of the acting chief and the testimony today and a comparison of how the explanations have changed. I think we've got a lot of work to do uh, on this committee, but I think we have to start with um, looking at the system and saying what should happen and who should have the authority to say, yes, we must have uh, extra help right now immediately, or no one can say, no, you can't have that, because that happened all up and down, and I think we really need to understand that. Uh, before we meet again. Thank you. No more questions. No. Ma'am, ma I agree that, that uh, there needs to be uh, a more robust communication, um, both leading up to an event uh, as well as during an event. Um, as, as, we, as we move into the communication realm, uh, we tend to to send out very uh, short, concise, non-transparent messaging for fear of sending out incorrect messaging. Um, that was something that was obviously apparent on the sixth, and that needs to change. Um, and I talked I talked about that at the uh, appropriations briefing, and I've asked my staff uh, to work on that because in a in a big event like that, we have to give you more information, not less. Um, the canned messaging may be good if there is a barrier that doesn't go down and you need to, to go in through another entrance, but not when it's a, not when it's a considerable life safety event. You need to have the information available to be able to, to make the best decision to protect yourself. And I, and I agree with you that that needs to be looked at and corrected. And in, in, some, situations, the, Mr. in some situations, the, uh, I know in my situation, I was Hill House and I was quarantined. And so we were, of course, under threat of a, a bomb. So we ran out in the street. And then what happens out in the street? I had a situation where a police officer recognized me and said, where can you go to be safe? And I couldn't go back to where I lived. So he helped me get to where my, my office was. We got inside the building, but the security person said, no, she's not allowed to go in her own office and be locked in her office to stay safe. So there is there is a, a communication problem from the lowest level to the top level of what is important, what is immediate, and who has the uh, the authority. Yes, ma'am, I agree. Um, Capitol Police is acknowledging that there are numerous lessons to be learned uh, from the top down. We are leaning forward. Uh, we're actively working with the task force that the speaker has um, at the request of Lieutenant uh, General Russell Honore. So we're leaning forward uh, with those recommendations, really conducting several assessments from the Office of the Inspector General, our own internal assessments, but really acknowledging what can we do in the short term to acknowledge those failures and make sure that those things don't happen again. And then leaning forward to say, what are those long-term projections that we can uh, implement over time as it relates to training, uh, policies and procedures, uh, equipment and things of that nature. We put a number of requests in the FY22 budget so that we can ensure that our officers have the proper tools and resources needed so that something like January 6th never happens again. Uh, we are leaning forward to improve our communications, not only with internally with our officers and leadership, we've also leaned forward. And I think that Mr. Blodgett and I recognize the failures of the previous uh, Capitol Police Board as it relates to communications. And we have a robust communications. Tim and I talk. Uh, daily, multiple times a day. So we acknowledge that there are a lot of things that should have been done differently, but this is an opportunity for us to make change and we're making that happen. 
Thanks, Ms. Granger. I mean, that, that's the question, uh, Chief Pittman, that I was getting to about, about the, 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 the training and particular training. Now you have, here you have, uh, the ranking member of the, uh, you know, appropriations committee and the officers weren't properly trained to be able to even know where to take her in that situation. And that we, we find that unacceptable. Um, Ms. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to both of our witnesses, and in particular to Acting Chief Pittman. I want to thank your department uh, and you for the valiant efforts to protect us, the Capitol, and our democracy during the January 6th insurrection, and also for the work you do every single day. And on a personal note, I want to thank you and your department for the recent efforts to bring to justice an individual who threatened me and my staff. But if we are going to ensure the safety of the Capitol and our democracy going forward, we must get to the truth and a complete understanding of what took place. My goal is to honor those officers who gave their lives, to honor everyone who was injured, terrorized, and traumatized. And I cannot get past a glaring discrepancy between intelligence received and preparation. So I want to start with the special assessment uh, of January 3rd. You testify in writing that the U.S. Capitol Police were aware that there were militia members white supremacists and other extremist groups who were coming to D.C. on January 6th, that they were armed, that they were targeting Congress and the joint session certification process, and that they were motivated by seeing this as the last opportunity to, quote, overturn the election. That is some who, what, when, why uh, listing And you testified that this special assessment was widely distributed through the U.S. Capitol Police and to the sergeant at arms, including that there was responsibility of sergeants and lieutenants to ensure that the rank and file got this vital information. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. You also testified that this special assessment was discussed at the January 4th multi-agency meeting. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And again, it was brought up on January 5th. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Mr. Blodgett testifies that on January 4th, January 5th, January 6th, the U.S. Capitol Police listed the probability of civil disobedience as, quote, remote, highly improbable, or improbable. My, your own testimony today says that that January 3rd assessment, quote, foretold of a significant likelihood for violence on the Capitol grounds. How do you rectify these two polar opposite um, analysis of the likelihood of violence? Yes. So those documents uh, that you're reading from that state that some groups were going to be improbable or, or less likely to incite violence is an, not even an assessment. It's a document that's provided by one analyst. So, for example, there are several, there are hundreds of documents that are combed through by our task force agents. We receive uh, information through open source and, and from a number of sources that we have analysts that comb through that information to put together the assessment. So, if, if I could explain it as being tiered, the special assessment is uh, the highest tier of assessment rating, but that is the document that you are going, that we are going to use as a department to make operational plans 
for any type of demonstration. So let me follow up on that. So your testimony is that to make operational plans, you were going with this assessment that you had that there were armed militia members coming, targeting Congress, and that was a significant likelihood of violence. That was your position. Okay. On January 5th, Uh, The Norfolk FBI sends intelligence that says, in part, uh, comments picked up online that Congress needs to hear glass breaking and doors being kicked in, blood from their BLM and Antifa soldiers being spilled, that there were maps being shared of the Capitol tunnels and facilities, and rallying points for groups traveling to D.C., It is disputed who saw this report, but you do not dispute that it was received by the U.S. Capitol Police. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And if I could just follow up with some additional on that Norfolk document. That document was sent the evening of January 5th. Uh, We know that it was received by task force agents with U.S. Capitol Police. But I think that to put it in its proper context, that FBI document also stated that this is an information report, not finally evaluated intelligence. It was being shared for informational purposes, but has not been fully evaluated, integrated with other information, interpreted or analyzed. Receiving agencies are requested not to take action based on this raw reporting. So I think that I would consider that an additional document that would feed into the assessment that was consistent, but Capitol Police already knew. We knew that the white supremacist groups and militia groups were coming, and we did anticipate those groups being violent. In fact, you said there was a significant likelihood, and you had already looped that into the fact that this was going to be different and targeted at Congress and at interrupting the electoral college process. So now we have some disagreement about whether Chief Sun actually asked for a declaration of a state of emergency. Mr. Blodgett says his understanding from the former Sergeant at Arms, Irving, uh, that he says this never happened. But boy, does this look like we have a violent situation brewing. And you sent counterintelligence officers uh, to the rally that day. You must have seen the crowds that were gathering. You must have been gathering that intelligence back. That's in your testimony. Yet still we come down to this failure to be ready. That there is, you know, 140 helmets that are ordered. Maybe 126 National Guard might be able to come help when we are at a significant likelihood of attacks. And however we tear that FBI report, it fed right into what you knew already. So my question is in the end of this, and I see that I am out of time. We had white supremacy that's fueling the violence white supremacy that fueled the big lie about our elections. Do you believe that institutional racism, that a culture of white supremacy, and I'm not saying any specific person or one action, do you believe that played a role in the discrepancy between the intelligence received, the assessment of the likelihood of violence and the preparation that left our officers um, really uh, at the mercy of the mob. So as the first black and female chief of this department, I take any allegation of inequitable policing extremely seriously. I can assure you that under my command, uh, the USCP will continue to police equitably. With that said, I have no evidence whatsoever that suggests that there was any discrepancy uh, based on our security posture and uh, as it relates to making enhancements or not based upon race. (sighs) 
Do you believe that um, part of us moving forward on this, um, there are many things we have to do, technical and otherwise, but how are you going to plan in this new position with the morale being so low and especially for um, those people of color in, you know, our capital community on your force who see all of this through a very different lens and life experience. How are you going to address this and get to uh, addressing institutional racism that exists in every institution we have here at the Capitol Police to ensure that this does not play a role in the decisions that we make? Absolutely. As the granddaughter of civil rights activists, a proud graduate of an HBCU university, and the mother of two African-American sons, I know all too well about the differences as it relates to policing and institutional racism. After the Black Lives Matter movement uh, during the summer, I spearheaded town hall meetings for the first time at U.S. Capitol Police where I provided a platform for officers to express their concerns with law enforcement as it relates to race. We brought in speakers, chiefs from all over the country, and we provided an opportunity for officers to speak freely so that we could address some of those morale issues that occurred after the Black Lives Matter movement. I am proud to say that from those town halls, we were able to identify themes working with our training services division, as well as the employ employment assistance uh, program to ensure that our officers have the tools and resources that they need to address things like institutional racism. We will be leaning forward with the executive team to continue to ensure that our officers remain trained up on things such as unconscious bias, implicit bias, but we will also pro be providing new platforms to address those uh, themes that were identified in October of 2020 last year as it relates to policing and institutional racism. Thank you, Chief Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, Ms. Thank Ms. you, Ms. Chief Ramadan. Chairman. Hey, Mr. Chairman, thanks. I want to start with, uh, with Tim Blodgett. Uh, Tim, you there? Yeah, I'm here, sir. Hey, listen, first things first, but before we move into where we're going from here, because there's plenty of people paying attention to, to the six, and, and I get that, and I appreciate that. But in the background of your shot, you have a Buffalo Bills helmet. And, and I'm just telling, I'm not giving you political advice. I'm just saying, quite frankly, the committee chairman is from the state of Ohio, and I don't think they play there. If you need something, try this book that the chairman wrote. It's not a page termer, but the chairman did write it. So as we go forward, just a thought. Now let's go to the, the topic at hand, huh? Um, hey, I, I want to I concentrate on, on, on where we're heading as a result of lessons learned from this. And, and the first thing I'd, I'd like to do is I hope that as we're looking about security examinations and going forward that we're taking a holistic look. And so I want your response to this, which is, listen, I know equipment's part of it. I know procedures are part of it. Chief, this applies to your folks too. I know training's part of it. I know communication's part of it. I know standard operating procedures in the future are part of it. I want your response to, as we decide what role barriers play, and in case anybody's missing it, it's, it's temporary prison fences with razor wire that we can mold all this stuff together and say, in a holistic way, Okay, so barriers play a part of it, but we don't want the maximum barrier, you know, like we're not doing other stuff. It's like, let's take a look at what our posture is in terms of how we operate, how we train, how we talk with the National Guard, how we whatever. And so I, w I would like, if it's possible, to have you put something on the record that as we talk about what the holistic way to go is that we evaluate all these tools at our disposal in a lessons learned sense uh, and don't just go back to, we want to do the maximum of everything. And the first thing is, 
it's kind of like working in, in working in a, in a minimum security prison right now. And I'm not trying to be judgmental on anybody. I'm just saying, quite frankly, fences and razor wire are, are and, and by the way, the architect of the Capitol should be involved. But I mean, in terms of placements and, and effectiveness, as opposed to, to stark visual sadness. So holistic approach, what do you think, Mr. Sergeant at Arms? Well, I, I agree there has to be a holistic approach, uh, sir. Um, the, the general honore study, as well as studies that uh, Security Services Bureau is doing um, and any that the architect may, may do at some point um, will take into account uh, the security uh, hardening that has to come around the campus. Uh, look to a future uh, state, and by future state, I don't mean looking at necessarily barriers, but what new technology can we implement uh, to keep the openness of the capital? Um, the chief has a plan for uh, for attempting to draw down the guard, the, the wire, and the fencing. It won't be uh, as fast as some people want, and it will be longer than other people want. Uh, but we'll be working with the, the committee and leadership on that, um, as well as any structural uh, items that have to be done, uh, especially the big ticket structural items. Your committee's going to be uh, fully engaged in your staff. So, you know, we're well, going to be looking to you too. And I appreciate that. So expect that to be a continuing um, uh, line of questioning in terms of transitioning away from the penal institution look for the nation's capital campus. And, and I like, I'm not, I'm not putting that at anybody's doorstep. I'm just saying as we get farther away, we, we should be able to transition to something that once again is, is non-penal. Um, Chief, uh, a couple of things for you. First of all, um, I'm, I'm gonna ask you this question. I don't expect you to have the answer right off the top. So you can just re return to to us and, and the other members of the committee. Um, but, but I was listening to your testimony and, and you said tens of thousands and I'm looking at the documents available to me and I know that there were uh, approximately 30,000 at the rally and that DOJ has estimated approximately 800 people entered the building. I, I just like to know what, what the what the source for the data of, uh, unless I misunderstood you, say uh, the, the statement that there were tens of thousands of people and, and obviously I'm talking about the Capitol and, and and so maybe I'm wrong, but, but I was unaware of the fact when you say tens of thousands of people, that means 20,000 or more to me that were basically outside the Capitol, north, south, east, or west. And, and so I'd just like you to get back with us and give us the authority, the authority for that statement. Along those same lines, when you said you had all of your surveillance people deployed, I, I want to know what that number was. And so that's fine for online. For purposes of my limited time today, um, there are some pedestrian issues that are current. And I'll give you an example of the one at, uh, at I think it's C Street and, and behind Cannon, um, right there by the, uh, the, the Madison building, where the fencing has been deployed in a way that for pedestri pedestrian people that are, that are entering that after being screened, um, they basically put the fence all over the sidewalk. So you either have to traipse through a flower bed or kind of see how you can shimmy through on that. So I would appreciate it if there is someone our office could contact for purposes of fencing placement and just walk the perimeter so that if it's something where it can be relocated, so sidewalks are actually conducive to pedestrian traffic for those who are cleared to enter the campus, that that can actually take place. Sir, I, I believe uh, we have opened up some pedestrian accesses as of this morning uh, based on some feedback we heard yesterday. So if it hasn't been open, please let us know and we'll look into that. Well, don't misunderstand me. It's open. You just have to be able to walk through a flower bed to use the access point. And by the way, that's the metro access, which has always been open. It is unacceptable that you have people queuing up to get through a gate for pedestrian access that the fence has rendered pedestrian access difficult to be generous. We'll, we'll take a look at that, sir. Thank you. Okay. And then finally, I would like to know, that's not you, that's the chief or, or and you, but finally, I would, I would like to, um, to, to get a briefing a little later on what the coordination is between both of your offices and the, the AOC in terms of fence design, 
uh, evaluating the proper places for whatever those barriers are as we go forward. And, and listen, I'm not suggesting an answer. I just want to know that, that issue is being worked as opposed to, yeah, yeah, that's we'll get that later on. And the final one that I want offline is this. Who has operational control over the National Guard troops on the Capitol campus right now? For example, if there's an incident at that area where I told you that the, the gate where the sidewalk is, uh, it's like, so something happens there and we've got an incident and stuff's going, who's in charge? Um, how do they handle that, at least in the first 30 minutes? Um, I'm hoping that the communication issues that we've been hearing about are not communications issues in terms of using those resources in, quite frankly, a coordinated chain of command if something pops up. And I'll take all those offline later on. I'm mindful of your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. I, I'd like to just kind of follow up and, and uh, ask Chief Pittman if she could answer the question about the tens of thousands of uh, insurrectionists, um, what that exact number was of people on the Capitol complex that were pushing through to get to the Capitol. If you could get us that, not, do you have that number handy, Chief? Yes, I do. So we based that number off the numbers that were screened down at the ellipse from the Secret Service. We know that they screened over 15,000. I believe that number was closer to 20,000. And there were 15,000 approximately that were outside of the ellipse that were unscreened. We know that those groups left there from our camera footage and came to Capitol Hill. So that's where those numbers are primarily based off of. We know what they were able to screen down at uh, the ellipse. And then as it relates, uh, a couple of follow-up, if I may, sir. Uh, first and foremost, there was a question previously as it relates to evacuation uh, routes. So I am uh, willing to provide that. I know that some of that information is sensitive, if not classified, if you will. So I'd like to provide a follow-up answer as it relates to why we evacuated uh, some of the chambers in the manner that we did. Uh, as it relates to infrastructure, uh, we are actively working, as I said, with the uh, task force. And I know that I speak for everyone here in the leadership when it comes to the fencing that's surrounding the campus, as well as the National Guard. Uh, we have no intention of keeping the National Guard soldiers uh, or that fencing any longer than what is actually needed. Uh, we're actively working with a scaled down approach so that we can make sure that we address three primary variables. One is the known threat to the environment. Two is the infrastructure vulnerabilities. And then that third variable being the limitations that U U.S. Capitol Police know knows that it has as it relates to human capital and technology resources. So we are actively addressing those. Uh, if I may just add one more point. With that said, we know that the insurrectionists that attacked the Capitol weren't only interested in, in attacking members of Congress and officers. They wanted to send a symbolic message to the nation as of who was in charge of that legislative process. We know that members of the militia groups that were present on January 6th have stated their desires that they want to blow up the Capitol and kill as many members as possible uh, with a direct nexus to the State of the Union, which we know that date has not been identified. So based on that information, we think that it's prudent that Capitol Police maintain it's enhanced and robust security posture until we address those vulnerabilities going forward. Uh, sir, as it relates to the fencing and the problems with the pedestrian access, I will reach out to your office today and make sure that I will lean forward by taking action, working with the House Sergeant at Arms to ensure that pedestrian and staff that need to traverse the grounds are able to do so in a safe and efficient manner. And one more side note for the chairman, you said that you were from the great state of Ohio and we gave Mr. Blodgett a hard time about his bills. I can tell you that my husband is from the great state of Alabama and we are avid Roll Tide, Crimson Tide, national champions and fans. 
So I just had to put that plug in there for my Roll Tide fans on the call. Thank you, sir. Thanks, thanks, Steve. That that will that will get you nowhere with me. I'll tell you right out of the gate. Uh, uh, as a, an Ohio State Buckeye, uh, if you could, Chief. Um, Again, I'm sorry, Mr. Case is next. Just let me slide this in because I think what Mr. Amade's uh, questions were were important. What what was the number outside the Capitol? We know that it was 15,000 maybe plus at the Ellipse. How many made their way down to the Capitol with the bike fencing uh, right after that? We don't have an exact number. Like we didn't uh, implement screening that day like service, but based on the estimates that we saw from our TV camera, we could tell approximately who was coming uh, from the ellipse to the Capitol ground. So we know that there were uh, excess of 10,000 uh, demonstrators that traversed the campus on January 6th. So you, you think it was 10,000 that came to the Capitol, left the ellipse, walked down to the Capitol, and then forced their way in. I think that we were well in excess of 10,000 that traversed the grounds. But as far as the numbers that actually came into the building, we estimate that that was approximately 800 demonstrators. Okay, well, that that, that brings about a lot of questions around use of force and, and, and other things. Uh, Mr. Case. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Blodgett, Chief Pittman, I want to go back to a line of questioning that I pursued yesterday with uh, the architect of the Capitol. And the gist of that is how do we best figure out what happened, why it happened, and how to move forward? Um, the observation that I have <clears throat> is that um, we need some independent objective outside review and advice. Um, I think even the best of us um, in circumstances such as this uh, um, are, are hard pressed to evaluate ourselves, uh, to, to um, evaluate where we ourselves made mistakes. Chief Pittman, you were there at the time, uh, so you're not objective uh, uh, in that sense. Uh, and you may have done everything exactly right, but the, but the, but the issue is that you, you were part of it. And so therefore, um, the question is, uh, how can we get to the, to the right overall answers? Um, and so in that, uh, in that spirit, what I'd like to ask is, first of all, just for clarification of exactly what investigations of any kind do you know are underway right now, and aside from obviously the oversight function of Congress itself, including this subcommittee. My understanding um, is that we basically have at least three that I know of. Uh, the first, of course, is the General Honor Ray Study, which is focused on the physical security of the Capitol complex. Uh, the second is um, the architect of the Capitol, which is similarly focused on physical security, um, uh, in which he at least has some outside uh, input through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in their area of expertise. I also believe, uh, Chief Pittman, that you've referred to an internal U.S. Capitol Police uh, review. Um, and so I'll, I'll just go with you, Chief. Uh, first of all, um, is that correct? Do you have your own review underway, and, and are either of you aware of any other um, more formal active reviews. Yes, sir. So Capitol Police does house what we call the Security Services Bureau. It's primarily responsible for uh, securing national uh, security uh, documents as well as our physical security uh, implementation of equipment and or procedures. So Security Services Bureau is conducting an internal assessment. The Office of the Inspector General is also conducting an assessment that would be considered external to Capitol Police. Uh, you already mentioned the uh, task force that's being led by General Honore. They're conducting an assessment primarily as it relates to infrastructure, as well as some of our policies and procedures. And then lastly, uh, the GAO is also conducting an assessment of the January 6th event. Okay, so let me just go to those. So when you refer to the Office of the Inspector General, just for my own clarification, what are you referring to there? That's not the GAO. It is, it is who? Yes, yeah, so the Office of Inspector General, Inspector General is independent of Capitol Police. 
Uh, they provide oversight typically to the Capitol Police Board and some of our appropriators uh, as to the um, operations, if you will, to Capitol Police. Uh, they not only do this for incidents like the January 6th event, this is an ongoing independent review uh, that's routinely uh, analyzing Capitol Police's policies and procedures. And then once they uh, make those analyzations, they then turn that information over to the board and make recommendations that Capitol Police uh, must adhere to to ensure that we are adhering to the best practices uh, for a federal agency. And I would just turn it over to Mr. Blodgett in case he has any additional as it relates to the OIG. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, the uh, Inspector General is going through and investigating various uh, points along along the uh, you know the January sixth uh, time frame and the different units, uh, and will be coming out with a series of reports on that. Other than the other than the reviews that the Chief is has spoken of, I'm, I'm unaware of any other independent review other than the criminal cases that are going on. Well, there there is certainly the 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 overall uh, review by the FBI, which is which we haven't uh, really made reference to, but obviously that is that is underway. Um, so so going back to the 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 um, question of adequate independent objective um, <clears throat> review and advice, you, you know, I, it's, it strikes me that the the, the physical infrastructure side of this. Uh, that's a very difficult question with a lot of difficult, uh, you know, decisions to be made at the end of the day. But um, it it is more about a a, a physical structure uh, to to protect uh, the capital and uh, its inhabitants. Um, what we're really at in these hearings, I think, far more is is the um, the organizational structure of of the capital, um, whether that structure. Um, worked, which I think we all have concluded it didn't. Um, whether the, the the failures were failures of, of of people under difficult circumstances, or failures of systems, or exactly where those failures occurred, and how can we correct for those to assure that they don't get repeated? And so, Chief Pittman, and and, and I would also observe that the architect, architect of the Capitol yesterday observed uh, the possibility. Of engaging other parts of our federal government who have dealt with similar similar crisis management situations and have come up with their own best practices. Uh, for example, the architect mentioned uh, the Department of Defense, also the Secret Service. Chief Pittman, I've got to ask you pretty straight because um, I am concerned about your your objectivity, uh, not you personally, Chief, but somebody in your situation uh, who who again was, um, you know, there has a responsibility uh, and, and obligation. And as you said, a friendship uh, with many of your of your colleagues. Um, I'm concerned about the ability uh, in that context to develop um, that kind of independent objective review that I think any of us would want. I mean, it would be comparable to to asking a member of Congress to, to investigate and conclude the, the ethics investigations against him or her. And, you know, so that just, that's just, doesn't happen, right? So, so what do you think? Do you think that we have the right processes in place uh, to get to the bottom of this and to make the 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 the, the, the correct judgments that we have to make going forward? Do you do you see a need for any further uh, review or structure, or what do you think about the possibilities of the DoD and or the Secret Service or some other uh, structure? I think, and I, I would add to that. Excuse me, Chair. I would add to that uh, that Mr. Amity's uh, line of questioning uh, was resonant with me in terms of looking at a more holistic view of this, uh, meaning a, a, a across the board view where we are not thinking in terms of stovepipes. My, my observation here is that there are a lot of stovepiping going on, and not a whole bunch of communication across the board, and that structure broke down. And in that way, it's not all that dissimilar to some of the, the, the critical and tragic um, um, in retro retrospect, mistakes in systems that occurred around 9/11. So, how do how do we how do we crack through all of this, Chief? What, what's your thought on it? Yes. yes. So I know that there are the three independent uh, after action reviews, if you will, in addition to U.S. Capitol Police's internal assessment uh, by the groups that I identified. It is also my understanding that at the speaker's request. 
There is going to be a 9-11 style uh, commission, if you will, similar to what occurred after the 9-11, September 11 attacks. So I believe that those groups of independent evaluators will come in and advise uh, things that we can do in addition to what the external evaluators will provide as well. So I think that's going to be key and prudent going forward, uh, soliciting those from outside of even the organizations that we've named that would come in and provide that independent assessment <coughs> review to state how we would go forward, particularly in the long term. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, uh, Mr. Case. Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate both of you being here with us this morning. Um, uh, kind of along the same lines as Mr. Case's questions, uh, both of you are members of the, of the Capitol Police Board, where uh, you weren't at the time of January 6th, but you know, at the, as the structure is, uh, your positions are, and you receive information from um, uh, different air agencies uh, uh, about threats to the Capitol, et cetera. We've, we've, we've heard that process. Uh, we learned earlier this week uh, from testimony given in the Senate uh, that uh, the Capitol Police Board did not receive an FBI threat report warning that there were people traveling to Washington to commit acts of violence. Um, uh, Ms. Pittman, you at, on January 6th were the Assistant Chief of Police of the Department of Protective and Intelligence Operations. I, I hope I have that title correct. And uh, this morning, I believe I heard you say that the Capitol Police did in fact um, receive the said report on January 5th. So my, I guess kind of like I said, along the lines of Mr. Case's questioning, Tell me what what should have happened or what you did to make sure the, the police board uh, got that very important information, uh, or they say they didn't. And so why didn't they? And what happened? What broke down to where a critical piece of intelligence was not shared with the decision makers uh, that may maybe could have allowed a better, a better preparation uh, prior to January 6th? Yes, sir. So that FBI document that was shared on the evening of the 5th, it was shared with task force agents that are embedded uh, from Capitol Police with the FBI. Uh, they in turn uh, sent their email, that email that they received to a lieutenant within the protective and intelligence operations side of the house. That information was not then forwarded any further up the chain. So that is a lesson learned for U.S. Capitol Police. And I put in corrective measures to ensure that going forward, information is shared in a timely fashion and it's shared appropriately going up the chain of command. Uh, with that said, we do not believe that based on the information in that document, we would have changed our posture per se. The information that was shared was very similar to what U.S. Capitol Police already had in terms of the militia groups, the white supremacist groups, as well as the extremists that were going to participate in acts of violence and potentially be harmed on, uh, armed, I should say, on the campus. So moving forward, we've put in corrective internal controls to ensure that information is shared in a timely fashion because we understand that that was a breakdown in communication. We own that and we've uh, taken protective, uh, corrective measures to uh, change that going forward. But you just said, if I understood you, that even if it had moved up the chain, you wouldn't have done anything different. That is correct, sir. We do not believe that that document in and of itself would have changed our posture. We believe it was consistent with the information and intelligence that we already had, that those groups were going to be violent and they were expected to participate uh, in unlawful activity on the campus. Uh, the, 
the one thing that we were already leaning forward and asking for was additional resources as it relates to the request for the National Guard. That request at that time had already been denied, and we made that request repeatedly after January 5th uh, to include several more denials before the National Guard were actually on campus. So uh, that would be the request that we did make after the fact. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, would it be proper to ask the, to, for the committee to be able to see firsthand copies of, of some of these reports that are being referred to? That would give us you know, better information and context as to what they were seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, one more question. I know my time is running short, but I appreciate your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, while, while I was on the floor of the House uh, as the building was being um, uh, broken into, uh, my staff was in the Cannon, in my office in the Cannon building. Um, and at that time, uh, there was a pipe bomb that had been discovered uh, near the Cannon building. So, uh, uh, we received, uh, but let, let, let me just try to recount that day as accurately as I can. My staff received an emergency notification from the Capitol Police about an evacuation of the Madison building. I believe that was at 1.10 p.m. The next communication that they received from the Capitol Police were officers running down the hallway, banging on doors and yelling uh, to people to evacuate immediately, not identifying themselves. So it was, there was some, a little bit of vagueness as who was actually telling people to come out of their offices. And then it wasn't until nearly 15 minutes later, after they had evacuated, that they received official notification about the evacuation of the Cannon Bill. That was at 123. So uh, I guess as an appropriations committee, my question has to do with despite substantial resources that we have appropriated to your department um, at the request, obviously, of your predecessors. The emergency notification system uh, seems to continue to have issues. And so, um, Madam Pittman, I ask, would just like to ask the question, under your management now, uh, what kind of changes are you looking at to uh, rectify the notification system? Sorry, I was having a little trouble with the mute button. Um, yes, sir. So we've made a number of changes going forward as it relates to our communications. One primarily being those canned messages that we the department refers to in our joint emergency uh, mass notification system. I believe that Mr. Blodgett referred to it earlier as well. We understand that those pre-prepared messages, if you will, do not give the congressional community uh, in times of critical incidents uh, enough information uh, to proceed accordingly on the campus. So we are working with our command center staff to make sure that they are not just pushing out those pre-prepared messages, but actually providing more accurate, timely information to the community. We're also leaning forward, working with our law enforcement partners, as well as community partners like DCH SEMA, to make sure that our community notifications and improvements are coming from the U.S. Capitol Police's command center. We've also implemented several daily calls as it relates to intelligence and the information that we're able to share in a timely fashion by embedding not only our agents and some of the um, known uh, law enforcement leaders uh, as it relates to intelligence, for example, the FBI, but we also have the uh, law enforcement intelligence leaders embedded now here at Capitol Police. We believe that that will help to streamline uh, the relaying of that uh, information. And also to piggyback just on one of your other questions as it relates to that FBI document, and it ties right into how we're streamlining communications. The FBI already has a joint terrorism task force uh, executive committee, if you will, that is responsible for sharing all important communications with law enforcement leaders. 
uh, we believe that that intelligence document, uh, if it had been priority, and as I stated before, it states on the document itself, it wasn't for action. We do understand that that executive committee would have uh, streamlined the communication with law enforcement leaders, if you will, not yeah. just sharing it at the lowest level. Thank so, you, sir. Let me just observe about the notifications. The substance uh, of the message, that wasn't the issue. Uh, my my conjecture is that uh, if there's a 15-minute delay in emergency notifications, then really there's not an emergency notification. Uh, and by the way, those other notifications you're talking about uh, are helpful, but they're kind of like the boy that cried wolf. If we get six or eight notifications for one incident in a, in a building on campus, pretty soon you stop looking at them, just, just to throw that out there. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I know I'm over my time, but do I, would you allow me one more question? Just as I love you, go ahead. Make it quick. And let's let's uh, have a quick answer too from the. Okay, from I'll the make it really side. quick. And, uh, this That's is to Mr. Blodgett, and I know you've heard this question before, but I, I didn't hear it this morning, so I wanted to bring it up. Can, and, and you said at our briefing the other day that it's your 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 decision here, but I just wanted to ask about the magnet magnetometers entering the chamber of the house. Uh, tell me what's a security rationale there is for placing those there. Uh, you know, as members, we don't have to pass through the, these uh, devices to enter any other location on campus. Um, so I'm just curious as to what causes the, the threat to be imminent right there on the House floor. And then to your knowledge, is there any exceptions to members who, uh, whether or not they have to pass through there? And this is this is not meant to be a political dig, but this was an observation. On the 4th of this month, the Speaker Pelosi was observed uh, entering the House chamber without going through the metal detectors that she herself, I believe, has have ordered to be in place. So could you, could you reflect on those questions for me? Thank you, sir. Um, after the briefing, my attorney uh, slapped me in the head and uh, reminded me that the House voted um, HRS 73 and directed um, fines for complete screening security at the entrances of the chamber. So the screening um, at this point is, is within the House rule, um, and we're there to enforce, enforce the rule. Um, in terms of putting up the, the magnetometers, um, we had uh, members stating that they were carrying on the House floor. Uh, 40 U.S.C. 5104 states that firearms aren't allowed in the Capitol. With, uh, however, the Capitol Police Board uh, can have regulations to uh, to deal with that. Uh, there's a 1967 Capitol Police Board regulation that states that that uh, that firearms are not allowed on the House floor. Um, so I have to protect all the members. I have to protect them anywhere. Um, Congress is. Uh, particularly suited to change that if they don't want me to enforce uh, the statutes that they enact. Um, and in terms of enforcement, I rely on uh, the Capitol Police, who are the experts in the screening, to tell me if a member has not adequately gone through security screening. Um, and once I receive uh, the report from the Capitol Police, that is when I uh, impose the fine. And not because someone said, hey, they didn't do it. They're not the expert. The Capitol Police are the experts. Are there, exceptions? are there exceptions to the uh, usage of the requirement to go through? No exceptions. Okay. Um, they, they, they may, there may be someone with a medical exception card, um, which would be consistent with the Capitol Police screening. There's methods that the Capitol Police have to deal with that. So if there's a medical exception, uh, that would be different, but that would be consistent with the Capitol Police policies. Thank you. I mean, I All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, uh, Chief Pittman, I just want to follow up on something because uh, that, that Mr. Newhouse uh, brought up, and this has been kind of a theme throughout the, the hearing here. You're saying the FBI document wouldn't change anything. And, you know, the, the average person sitting in Ohio right now is saying, wait a minute, you, you've got this information through the Capitol Police. The FBI was saying the same thing. It's a whole other issue that that didn't make its way up to you or to Chief Sun. That's a whole other issue 
uh, about communication and all the rest. But when, when we're sitting here uh, having this conversation, the average person is saying, you're getting all this information of threats. You know these groups are going to be down there. What is your definition of a credible threat? And it's not that you would necessarily have to have to do something super like proactive and go after anybody, but knowing all that, knowing the tone and the tenor in the country, knowing the rally was happening, why wouldn't we have been prepared for the worst case scenario? That's what the average American is sitting home thinking about. So in a pointed way, can you tell us very clearly, what is your definition of a credible threat? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. So a credible threat is a, a threat that can be acted upon. What is the intention? Is there an opportunity for the individuals to actively uh, engage in this threat? Do they have access to the means of making that happen? As it relates to uh, U.S. Capitol Police changing its posture because of that FBI document, I believe that the clarification should be that we were already leaning forward based on that January 3rd assessment. So we were already leaning forward to increase those CDU platoons. We changed the security perimeter plan and all of those things that I've mentioned as it relates to how we beefed up what we had. With that said, I agree with you, Chairman. Hindsight is 2020. There are numerous lessons to be learned. If we were planning for uh, level six, I believe that Chief Sun, if he could get that day back, would have planned for a level uh, 10 uh, security posture. We would have had assets and resources on the ground prior to. We would have changed uh, from bike rack to the global fencing that we have in place now, but all of that uh, is lessons learned. And, and we still have a lot more to learn, but I think that it should be acknowledged that we were already uh, preparing for what we knew was going to be violent acts and civil disobedience for that day, uh, bringing in essentially every employee we had available to us and reaching out to our law enforcement partners uh, to make sure that we had some uh, pre-staged, if you will, which is why we had the immediate response from the Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, we're so thankful for them as well as the U.S. Secret Service. With that said, there were those additional requests for the National Guard. So there was uh, several uh, security enhancements that were requested. But with that said, it wasn't enough. It was I'm not, not, I'm not. I don't understand why Chief Sun and yourself weren't pushing for a full vote at the board. That that to me, if it was such a priority for you, then then why would you say I want to force a board vote? Let's bring in the architect of the Capitol. You know, we, we want to know exactly. I mean, to me, it's a, it's a you know, and you're right. Hindsight is 2020, but given everything going on, and there are going to be 15,000 people up the street. You know, to me, you adding two more dignitary protection people here or there and a person, a couple people to go into the crowd, that's fine and that's needed. But the reality of it is, even if you got to the National Guard, it was just a few hundred. We needed the whole thousand at the D.C. and Maryland and Virginia and all of that. And so uh, to me, it's you took the intelligence and, and I feel I feel like you didn't didn't put it all together and synthesize it in a way, go, holy cow, I mean, something really bad can happen here. And and given everything else going on, we need to be ready for that. And I don't think saying that, well, the Secret Service, uh, you know, didn't see a threat either. That, to me, doesn't cut it either, because who cares? So they got it wrong, too. Like, I mean, that that's that's the the underlying issue here. And really just trying to understand moving forward, I think it's going to be important for us to really understand what is a credible threat in this new reality uh, that we're living in. Ms. Wexton. Ms. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing today and for everything that you do to keep to keep our community safe. Um, and I want to thank you also for acknowledging the officers who died as a result of the events of January 6th uh, in your in your written testimony and in your testimony here today. Um, Chief Pittman, I just want to be absolutely clear for the record. Do you acknowledge that the that the uh, off death of Officer Brian Sicknick was a line of duty death? Yes, ma'am, I do. Do you acknowledge that Officer Howie Liebengood's death was a line of duty death? Uh, I can't speak to that at this time, ma'am. So you're, you're not going to acknowledge that, that it was a result, result of the events on January 6th that Howie Liebengood is no longer with us? I cannot speak to that uh, at this time. Why can't you speak to it at this time? Because it's still under active investigation. Well, do you acknowledge, I know that he's not your officer, but would you acknowledge that the officer Jeffrey Smith is MPD, that his death was a line of duty death? I'm sorry, officer Jeffrey Smith is not a US Capitol Police officer. So you're not gonna acknowledge that his death was a line of duty death either? I'm sorry, ma'am, he is not our officer, U.S. Capitol Police. So I'm kind of concerned, and I know that the ranking member brought up that, that you know, that, that, that there was a vote of no confidence for you in, in, in the union. And, uh, and I'm kind of concerned because you're not standing by your officers. I think it's very clear that Officer Liebengood would still be with us today, but for the events of January 6th. And, and the fact that you're not willing to stand by him today is very concerning to me. Now, the Capitol Police does offer death gratuities for survivors of all officers, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. As I stated before, I've been on this organization for over 20 years now. I do stand with my officers, and there's a large number of officers uh, that have expressed that they stand with the question, me. Captain, the, 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 uh, the, Chief, Chief, the question was, yes, does the Capitol Police offer death gratuities for survivors of all officers for any reason that they may have passed away? Yes, ma'am, we do. And did, can you confirm whether this has been at least been processed for the family of Officer Liebengood? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Has that death gratuity been processed for the family of Officer Liebengood such that his survivors will receive that payment? Yes, ma'am, it has. Okay, thank you. I yeah. want to talk a little bit a little bit more about the logistics and the number of, of officers that were on duty on January 6th and, and what you did to prepare. Now, on an average Sunday when Congress is not in session, what would the staffing levels be at the Capitol grounds with Capitol Police? About how many would be on duty? So on an average day, uh, our manpower is driven by whether uh, Congress is in session or out. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Capitol Police leaned forward with an aggressive, aggressive ready reserve posture. So we so took- I'm sorry, the question is what would the, what would the number of officers be on an average, let's say an average Sunday and the Congress is not in session? Yes, so I would say less than 700. And how about on an average Wednesday when Congress is in session? So those numbers upward uh, past a thousand. So that's just an average Wednesday. And it depends Wednesday on a, doing... a lot of, I'm sorry, it depends on a lot of factors, but that's kind of average. So over a thousand. Yes. Okay. And how many would be on duty for some sort of special dignitary event like a State of the Union? How many, how many officers would you have on duty for that? That would pretty much be our full complement with the exception uh, we would adjust shifts even for our midnights officers. They would come in early. So it's not as cut and dry uh, as we have X number of people. It just depends on the timing of the event. But that's typically a full hands on deck, if you will, for lack of a and, better term. And can you give us some sort of ballpark number of about what, what all hands on deck would entail in terms of numbers? U.S. Capitol Police's full strength right now is 18, over 1,800 officers. But okay. with that said, there's a complement of officers that would come and relieve those who had worked, let's just say, a 16-hour shift. 
because and we're a 24 seven operation. And how many did you have planned to have on duty prior to the January 3rd assessment? So, so prior to getting that assessment and making the adjustments that you, that you outline in your testimony, how many do you plan to have on duty? So the adjustments were made primarily to our civil disturbance units. A civil disturbance unit is comprised of, of what we- I'm just, I'm just asking you for terms. numbers, Chief Pittman. I'm just asking you for numbers. So, so yes, how I'm many just, did you plan uh, to have on duty? Given it context, we went from approximately four platoons to seven. Okay, and what is what are those is numbers? Forty mean? officers. I'm sorry. We went up to 276 officers for CD civil disturbance units. Okay, but the other officers stayed the same. No, ma'am. We also we were prepared for a 24 hour. Uh, session, if you will, based on the number of challenges that would be allowed to, as it relates to the electoral votes being counted. We knew that there were a number of hours that each state could contest those uh, electoral votes. So we prepared for going over 24 hours with our officers. So our officers were st strategically uh, positioned so that we would have coverage from zero uh, 800 hours on the 6th all the way through uh, January 7th. So over a 24 hour period. So between a thousand officers on an average day and 1800 officers on a, on a state of the union type day, how many officers were you expecting to have present for January so 6th? We had 1200 officers at approximately 12 p.m. on that day. And okay. then by 1600 hours, we had 1400 officers uh, on the campus on January 6th. But, the even, full be even, but even before even before you got that intelligence, you knew that you were going to have the first, second and third uh, officials in line for the presidency all in the same place at the same time, correct? Yes. Okay. So you would think that you would make it more of a more of a security um, more more along the lines of a state of the union than than you know an average day, and it sounds like even with the threat assessment, it was kind of still treated like an average day. No, ma'am. Now it's not there was some. There was some. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, my time okay. is. I, I, okay. I don't want to waste my time. Um, the uh, the there's been some talk about this January 3rd special assessment from your office, which went out on that Sunday. Is that correct? Sunday, January 3rd. Right. I'm sorry. That, as far as that, January special, 3rd? that special assessment from January 3rd that came out on a Sunday and was disseminated to to staff within the uh, Capitol Police, right? That was widely distributed within the department. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, in your written testimony, you said it was emailed to all officers above the rank of sergeant. Yes. Does that mean does that mean sergeant and above or lieutenants and above? Above the lieutenants and above. So isn't it, the sergeant, isn't it the sergeant? Isn't it the sergeants who handle the roll call and do the most have the most contact with the day-to-day -day officers on the street on the street? Yes, ma'am, Miss Wexon, I apologize. That's sergeant and above. Okay, so it did include sergeant. Yes, ma'am. Good. Good. And then there was some discussion from Representative Clark and Representative Newhouse about these daily intelligence reports that came out in the days following. Is that right? You acknowledge that those exist, right? Yes. And that they were disseminated to the sergeant at arms, the architect of the Capitol, the various folks within the uh, within the Capitol Police as well. Yes, that is correct. And you acknowledge that the threat assessments in those were down to remote, highly improbable, or improbable. Is that right? That's a separate assessment from that. Uh, report that was issued on January 3rd, but that is correct. Right, but they were subsequent reports that went out and were disseminated by, by the Capitol Police. Is that right? Yes, yes that okay. is correct. And you are going to, um, and you're going to provide those to this committee? Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, ma'am, I okay. will. Very good. Um, I want to follow up very briefly on a question from the ranking member about the, uh, about the command. Uh, and the communications. Uh, who made the call for the commanders to leave the incident command center and assist officers under assault? Is that is, there, is that a protocol? Is that a fail safe? I mean, what do you do when that happens? To leave the command center? 
we, you were talking about the communication center and that's why the, the, the officers on the ground were left to fend for themselves when it came to communication. Well, no, it's uh, referred to as the incident command system, not the command center itself. Okay, the incident command it, system. Yes. Who made the decision for, for that for that center to be abandoned? That incident no, command system to be abandoned? No, no, it's not a, a physical uh, place. It's a policy and procedure that we have that we uh, train to at, for critical incidents, if you will. Okay, so that you will have one line of communication coming from the top down to all the officers on the ground? Is that what the purpose of it is? It doesn't uh, align one communication down from the top. It's a structured system. It's tiered. Um, the person with boots on the ground has certain responsibilities, and then it defines each of those persons in the incident command structure, what their role and responsibility is. So is it safe to say that that structure failed on January 6th? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now, United States Capitol Police is notoriously opaque. You guys have had zero public press, press conferences in your department in the nearly two months since the attack. Now, having this kind of a news vacuum creates a, 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 a community where conspiracy theories and, theories and misinformation can spread easily. That's obviously something that's very concerning to all of us. Um, why haven't you had any public press briefings? Yes, ma'am. So U.S. Capitol Police has issued a number of press releases. But with that said, we felt like the primary responsibility after an attack like January 6th was really to focus on our employees, their health and well-being, as well as providing the necessary information uh, to our oversight committee. So we have uh, streamlined those communications, set up regular calls uh, with oversight and core leadership. So we make sure that we um, communicate it's, with it's, them it's on a regular basis. Two months. It's been almost two months. Will you commit to having public press briefings in the future from this point going forward? No, ma'am, not at this time. Okay, and if you if you I know that you're acting chief right now. If you become the the, the full on chief, and you're confirmed as chief, um, would you confer, Would you would you agree to have them at that point, or are you just it's just not something that you're interested in doing ever? My priorities would still be my employees first and foremost, and I know that I am to respond appropriately and timely to the oversight committees that govern not only the U.S. Capitol Police but the Capitol Police Board. All right, so you'll answer our questions, but not those of the press. Is that what I'm getting from you? No, well, ma'am, I'm not saying that I would not answer questions of the press, but leaning forward as we go forward, my priorities still would remain with the workforce and to the uh, committees that provide oversight as well as our appropriators. Okay. Thank you. And I just have one final question. As a member who, who represents a, a, a chunk of the national capital metro region, um, you know, looking at all these fences and having these fences around what, what really is a beautiful public park um, on any other day is, is disturbing and, uh, and, and not, not sustainable in my mind. Um, Chief Pittman and Mr. Blodgett, because I don't want you to feel left out, Mr. Blodgett, can you reassure us that the fencing around the Capitol is, is, is not permanent? Mr. Blodgett, we'll start with you. In my mind, it's not permanent, no. Okay, thank you. How about you, Chief Pittman? No, the temporary infrastructure is only to address the vulnerabilities after the attack of January 6th. Our priority is to make sure that the members of Congress are safe and that democratic process is protected. Once we have appropriate infrastructure and human assets in place, we will lean forward with the removal of the fencing. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I'm confident that my time has expired. I didn't see the timer going off, but uh, thank you so much for your indulgence and I'll yield back. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate it. Uh, great questions. And let me just say, uh, uh, Chief, I think, you know, we can do both. We appreciate your um, communications with us and that has improved dramatically, but we also think the 
American people and the press need to hear directly from you. So I would just encourage you to take some time, uh, you know, in making sure that, that the residents of Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C., the people around the country, after having watched what happened, um, would benefit from hearing from you directly. Uh, with that, our, our final member, I have Mr. Espayat. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, right now, I'm sort of like the Mar Mariano Rivera of this committee. A lot of the questions have been asked, but uh, uh, Chief, I, I want to thank you, and, and uh, Sergeant Navarro, I want to thank you for for uh, coming forward today. Um, I want to ask you, Chief, um, was there any uh, sweep of the Capitol of the or the premises around the Capitol order um, for explosives uh, during? the days uh, leading up to January 6th. I asked that question because um, as I came to my office that morning, early in the morning, um, I was walking on the sidewalk by Rayburn with some of the protesters. So obviously they were in the vicinity of the, of the Capitol and around the compounds of perhaps of the, of the Capitol much before the uh, actual the insurrection occurred, uh, the breaching of the Capitol occurred. So I wanted to know whether you had um, an order uh, the sweep of, of the office buildings and the Capitol compound for any potential explosives. Yes, sir. So U.S. Capitol Police does daily sweeps of the congressional uh, campus but specifically on uh, large events that are planned for the day. Uh, we have uh, canine detection dogs as well as additional uh, bomb uh, HDS units, hazardous device section. But those officers go out and conduct sweeps and they do what we call button up the premises uh, when we implement what is uh, restricted uh, to members and staff. But to answer yeah, but your question, yes, sir. Yeah, but I'm referring, for example, uh, I'm on Rayburn, and as I was coming uh, on, up Rayburn by the Horseshoe area, you, are you familiar with that area? Uh, yes, uh, there sir, is very a, familiar. Okay, so you know the area, and there is uh, green areas there, uh, and of course it's a drive-through horseshoe shape uh, entrance to to that part of Rayburn, uh, and there is green areas all around uh, Longworth and, of course, uh, Cannon as well. And people were just uh, part group, members of this uh, insurrectionist group were walking around there very early in the morning. Uh, was there any sweep whatsoever um, of those areas for any potential explosives? So the, the Capitol itself is what was closed off. Of course, we had the inaugural uh, platform that had been closed for a period of time on the west side of the uh, Capitol building and then the east front. But the areas that you're referring to outside of the uh, Longworth and Cannon were actually open uh, to the public. But those sweeps at the Capitol building. Sorry, I think my system cut off. Yeah, so so no sweeps occurred around uh, Cannon, Longworth, or, or or Rayburn, where most of the members uh, obviously were before the uh, the protest, the insurrection came to the Capitol building. Nothing, or oh, nothing occurred also the day before in preparation so for the uh, for the assault on Congress. Yes, yeah, so U.S. Capitol Police, and that's uh, probably I just was a little confused as it relates to your question, uh, specifically for the Capitol building and or for the congressional uh, office buildings, House or Senate side. U.S. Capitol Police conducts daily sweeps, not just uh, for this major event, but for the event itself, we closed off a portion of the grounds uh, over at the Capitol. But to answer your question, that is daily uh, that we conduct canine sweeps. Uh, we have specialized um, trained dogs, if you will, 
that do a uh, sweep of the premises, and that is on a regular basis. So that was done on that day and the prior days. How yes. extensive was that, given that you were expecting uh, some level of, of, of protests uh, in front of the Capitol and the surrounding areas? How extensive was the, the sweep effort that you conducted? Was it as you always do it on a regular basis, or did you intensify it? We sweep our grounds, yes, sir, like I said, on a daily basis. So we use a number of uh, deployments of canine capabilities, but I think that if we want to go into more granular details, we probably should talk more in a classified setting. Okay. Uh, now, you also uh, obviously coordinate with uh, local law enforcement and the FBI and and other law enforcement agencies. Um, and the RNC offices and the DNC offices are relatively close to the capital area. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I walk to the DNC offices, it's a two block walk from where I am right now. And uh, there's been reports that pipe bombs were found uh, near those offices. Uh, near the RNC and the DNC offices. Was there any um, sweeps for explosives uh, in those areas prior or during January 6th? Sorry. So no, sir, no sweeps were done at the RNC, DNC prior to January 6th, those areas are off our uh, Capitol grounds uh, proper. It's not in uh, line with our primary jurisdiction, if you will. So was there any communications with local law enforcement? And since you conduct suites on a regular basis here, as you uh, testify in Longworth, Cannon and, and Rayburn, was there any conversation with law enforcement about potential uh, uh, sweeps for explosive in those two uh, sites? So no, no, sir. We conduct daily intelligence briefs with our law enforcement partners. Uh, right before the 6th, there was a call with all the law enforcement in the region. But as it relates to them doing uh, sweeps of the extended jurisdiction, there was no conversation uh, specific to that. I mean, this is maybe an extended jurisdiction, but this is just a block away, basically. Uh, so it's within eye view of the capital of our Rayburn and, and Longworth. Um, the reason why I ask this, uh, Chief, is because uh, a potential next attack may not necessarily be uh, the way it occurred on January 6th. Uh, and so I'm concerned that your sweeping operations uh, for explosives may have to be uh, improved uh, and increased dramatically to keep us all safe. Um, I think that it's important that you come back to us at another point with more uh, detailed information about your capability to do this and whether or not, in fact, um, how extensive um, was it done on January 6th or the days before the, the seditious insurrection. I think it's important that we have that information and that you have the capability uh, to do that kind of work. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. I think, I appreciate, sir, I, we, yes, I we, Go ahead, go ahead, I'm Chief. Sorry, sir. Yes, we will evaluate that. I know that uh, the task force that's been assigned has already leaned forward in making recommendations in that area. Uh, with that said, while there were no sweeps done of the RNC, DNC prior to the 6th, we have coordinated uh, routine patrols, uh, posting officers, and a marked unit outside of those areas uh, to ensure uh, the safety of the community. But as it relates to canines specific specifically, 
we will lean forward with those recommendations and look forward to hearing what those assessments uh, suggest and, you know, proceed accordingly. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Bayard, for, for doing that. So just a couple quick follow-ups, Chief. My understanding was that, that the canine units weren't sweeping. Are you, are you, you clear on that? We're not sweeping. Uh, we, were seeing, we were leaning in all hands on deck. My understanding uh, was that there were a lot of uh, dogs in the canine unit that weren't um, being used. Is that true? I will follow up on the number of dogs being used, but I can tell you right now that we did conduct uh, sweeps of the campus on January 6th. There's no doubt about that. Okay, but it was like we. As to the number of dogs that were used to participate in the sweeps, I'd follow up on the specific number. But as far as the sweep of the campus, those happen daily. Yeah, no, I'm just saying we're we're the the previous answers that you gave were all hands on deck, leaning in, all of that. And if there were not enough sweeps happening, not enough dogs happening, because the pipe bombs were were they called in or were they? spotted how, how did you find that information out the rnc uh, owner notified us but as far uh going back to what you said about the sweeps no we are very clear on that as far as uh them sweeping the campus okay yes sir you're you're, you're saying that I, i'm just i just want to be very clear because your your position has has been throughout the last two and a half hours and we thank you for all your time is that it was all hands on deck. And I remember yesterday, uh, it was Captain Mendoza was saying she was on her way home and had to get called back. So what does that mean? I mean, that, that to me doesn't seem like all hands on deck if people are. Absolutely. And thank you, Chairman Brian, for providing us the opportunity to clarify. All hands on deck doesn't mean that they're all here at the same time. All hands on deck means that we were preparing for an operational period that would exceed 24 hours. So we bring in the bulk of the workforce during the heightened periods that we expect demonstrations. But we do understand that our workforce is human. They can't just continually work uh, sure. exceedingly past 24 hours. So there's a contingent of the workforce that comes in to provide relief for those that have been here in excess of 20 hours, sir. I got you. Um, th this is, we, we've got a lot of information here. I want to ask one, one final question. I will just say, and I, I, I want to thank all of the committee members for uh, great questions um, on both sides of the aisle. Um, the, the one, you know, a lot of disappointments here with the information flow, uh, not getting to where it needs to be, but also the response. Uh, again, um, what's a credible, what's a credible threat? Many of us would think that that information that was being presented was a credible threat. Uh, the the lack of pushing uh, from you guys on your side, um, both Chief Sun and yourself, to push the board to have a vote, um, to, to push harder and harder because of, you know, the end result is the rank and file men and women uh, ended up, you know, being and put in a situation that, that we believe they shouldn't have been in. The lack of equipment, uh, clearly there wasn't a review of the training. I mean, I was here after the, the years ago when the governor of Kentucky's plane started flying in the airspace coming towards the Capitol and the evacuation for, from us was run like hell. You know, we were all just running out. So that was, I can't remember, 10 plus years ago, um, if not more. Um, so there were all there's all these issues that that we absolutely need to deal with moving forward. The one question that I get most when I'm home in Northeast Ohio uh, is the issue around the use of force, um, because it was it was clear that that the men and women on the front lines weren't sure what to do as far as how to respond to what was happening, and again that tells me that there wasn't the, the level of training beforehand uh, or clarity coming from command throughout the incidents, which we've heard from multiple occasions from many of the rank and file members. So what was the use of force, uh, rules of engagement, policy, 
for the, the rank and file members on January 6th. So the U.S. Uh, Capitol Police use of force policy has not changed. Based on the type of event that we're responding to, our officers are required to use the amount of force that's necessary in any given situation. However, as it relates to lethal force, our officers are only permitted to engage in lethal force for the protection of life, uh, either their own or to, to protect another person's life. As it relates to for the protection of property, our officers did use less than lethal force, which is what they're permitted to do. Based on that, though, I acknowledge that there are additional of resources that this department needs. There is additional training that is needed for our officers. I too have been posed those same questions as it relates to use of force. So at this point, I have directed specific commanders, uh, those persons in charge of the Training Services Bureau to work along with uh, the CAO as well as our general counsel to provide that specific guidance to our officers. So we are leaning forward uh, with the direction that uh, those persons in charge of those areas of responsibility will lead the charge in making sure our officers have the training that they need going forward. Well, I, I hope you understand our frustration and uh, you weren't in charge, but you were one of the leaders uh, in, in the, at the Capitol Police on that day in the days leading up. And it's really frustrating for us who have become friends with so many of these uh, rank and file members who take care of us every single day here to watch them be put in a position where they're not told clearly what, what they can do to protect themselves. And they got kids and they got spouses. And, and as you said, they're your friends too. But, you know, we've got to make sure that the leadership of the Capitol Police uh, is operating and functioning at a very, very high level, especially in this current environment. And uh, I, I know you can tell from the committee uh, here and, and rank and file members of Congress who don't sit on this committee are extremely disappointed, extremely concerned that, that these guys, men and women that we love, uh, were put in this position. And you look at the lack of communication. You look at the lack of you guys, you guys didn't even see the FBI threat assessment. You know, so it's one thing to say, look, I mean, you know, we didn't we didn't see it. But even if we did. Uh, it wouldn't have changed things. Well, that's fine, but you need to see that stuff. I mean, what, what is the what is the information flow over there? Uh, and, and how does it not make its way? Because you said you didn't even see it, right? Did you, you weren't, you didn't see the FBI uh, report and nor did Chief Sun. That, that is mind boggling us, how given everything going on, the FBI issues a, some kind of report that, that confirms your, your uh, intelligence and it, it never makes its way to the chief of police or never made its way to you? I mean, what, what's going on? You know, I mean, these are these are legitimate questions. And I know you're doing daily calls and all of that, but I think at some level it's it's about judgment and it, it speaks to um, being able to run an efficient operation that allows for the kind of information flow in this day and age where we're picking up an enormous amount of intelligence, making sure that the right intelligence gets to the right people in a timely manner, and then the response is appropriate. That's the key there is to get the intelligence and, and have the guts uh, to tell uh, the Paul Irving or the sergeant at arms, like, you know, I'm not leaning in. I'm leaning into you to have a vote with the police board. And, and look, it takes a lot of nerve to be in a leadership position today like the one you're in. And we commend you for your service and your leadership and your, you know, everything you bring to bear. Um, but this is, you know, minute by minute, things can go sideways here. And uh, we've got to be pushing you and the department to, to run at a very, and function at a very, very high level because mistakes made at, the, at your level uh, lead to what, what happened here on the 6th. And, um, you know, we're, we're here to support you. That's our job on the Appropriations Committee is making sure you have the resources that you need. But, you know, you've got to be clear with us. You've got to make sure you're executing. I mean, these issues around equipment, it's hard to believe that, that uh, men and women of the Capitol Police don't have the, didn't have the equipment that they need 
Um, and, and so I've made my point. We've taken up a lot of your time today. You know, please uh, know that we appreciate your work and we, we know how difficult it is. Um, but we've got to expect the best. And, and, and that's what the American people tell us that we have to do. And that's our mission here. As I said, my opening statement to we're just caretakers here. You know, we come in and we come out and, you know, your position too. People come in and out of. We're caretakers. And so we've got to make sure that in this moment with everything going on, we've got to, we got to rise to the occasion. And, um, and, and the American people deserve that. So I want to thank you, uh, Chief Pittman. I want to thank, uh, Tim. Thank you so much. We're going to thank continue you, to be in dialogue. Again, I encourage you, Chief, to make sure you are trying to communicate to the press the best you can. I want to thank our staff on the committee uh, and all the members of this committee for, for a good hearing, and we'll continue to be in very, very close touch. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.